Welcome, I'm Magdalena Kaiser, Director of Public Relations for BQA Wines of Ontario, and here to uh, provide knowledge and resources on behalf of our industry. I'm very excited to be here today uh, to, to welcome you to VQA uh, Pinot Noir 2.0. This is part of a 10 uh, part series of webinars featuring BQA Wines of Ontario star varieties. And hopefully you have seen some of our previous sessions on Chardonnay and Riesling. And today we're featuring Pinot Noir, one of my favorite varieties for sure. And uh, following this, we'll also be, um, uh, please be sure to watch Gamay Noir and Cabernet Franc. Each of these uh, sessions are really focused to provide insight on the flavor profiles of the variety, uh, in this case, of course, Pinot Noir, and the different styles that we produce in Ontario. It's also a great opportunity to meet uh, the different producers. And uh, with that, I want to welcome back John Savo, who has led uh, the other sessions and who will be leading uh, the other two to follow after this. Uh, with that, we have six producers who will be speaking about their uh, particular wineries and also the special wines that we're featuring today. We're really excited today because uh, right now harvest is going on in Ontario and they've each taken time to talk to us. So with that, uh, please, John, take us through a, a great session on Pinot. Thank you, Magdalena, and great to be back here. I'm so, par so proud of the Ontario wine industry as a wine critic and having been in the, in the wine writing business since the 90s, I've been able to see the industry grow and flourish and really now I, I can say this with utter confidence, create some, some really world-class wines and I've seen this in action. I've hosted many groups of sommeliers from around the world, the UK and the US in particular, and it's so great to see them come into our backyard, taste our wines and say, wow, there's really something special going on here. So uh, we're going to jump right into it. As Magdalena said, our winemakers are busy in the middle of harvest. It is September. It is harvest season in Ontario. And in just a moment, we'll bring in Mauro Salvador from Vieni Estates, Frederick Picard from Huff Estates down in Prince Edward County. We've got David Shepard from Flat Rock Cellars, Keith Tires also from PEC and Clausen Chase, Rob Power, from Dan and Igra and Elias Senchuk from Leaning Post Wine. So those will be our protagonists for the day, but I'd like to take you just through a very brief intro or re-intro as it were, of uh, some of the things that make Ontario wine a little unique, a little different, a little special, some information to share with your customers as they come into the store, looking for answers as to what makes these wines what they are. So really, to reiterate off the top, it is a story of latitude, lakes and limestone. And here you can see the beautiful Newdorf vineyard here. It doesn't really get into what I want to show, which is starting with latitude. Again, I'm going to direct you to see the first uh, presentation on Chardonnay, where I go a little bit more deeply into the characteristics of Ontario wine country. But just to remind you, of course, latitude, Ontario wine regions between about 41 and now 45 degrees north, if we count the Ottawa Valley, which we do, which uh, in the international context of things puts us right in the middle of that sweet spot for grape growing between about 30, 35 really and, and 50 degrees latitude north, beyond which you can't really grow grapes viably. It's all about length of season, length of day, sunlight hour. So if you're in that little stretch of the planet, you're in the right spot. Of course, we don't have the same climate as they do over in other parts of Europe, for example, at the same latitude or over on the West Coast. Those areas are moderated by different factors. For us in Ontario, it's all about the lakes. In fact, without the lakes, Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, we would not be growing grapes. So here is a cross section, kind of cross section east to west uh, of the Great Lakes system. And I bring this up just to show you a couple of important things. Well, for one, you can see the beautiful escarpment over which water runs, creating the, the Niagara Falls, 51 meter drop or 53 meters, depending on where you measure, which rocks you hit at the bottom. But a pretty spectacular feature, not so much for grape growing, but certainly a spectacular feature that brings in millions of tourists each year into Niagara wine country to enjoy not only the falls, but the wine. But the important thing from the winemaking perspective is look at the depth of Lake Ontario. It is the second deepest of the Great Lakes after Superior, near 220 plus meters at its deepest point. Why is that relevant? It means that it is a massive energy sink, a geothermal 
piece of water that moderates the climate quite heavily. It means it never freezes. It's too deep to freeze, if that is an expression, which means even in the depths of the Canadian winter, the lake protects onshore areas and prevents the temper temperature from dropping below much uh, uh, under 22 minus 22 minus 23, at which point it gets really dicey for grapes. So we have the protection of the lake in the winter. We have the moderating effect of the lake in the summer. And more on that as we get into, say, some of the sub Appalachians and, and some of the other areas. And then the, the final piece of that puzzle is limestone. This is not Niagara Falls, it is the beautiful Balls Falls just outside of Vineland. And here you can see in, in stark uh, contrast the sedimentary layers of limestone, mostly dolomitic limestone in the Niagara Peninsula, a little bit more calcitic limestone in Prince Edward County, nuances that make all the difference, particularly for a variety like Pinot Noir, which we all know is a very sensitive variety to place minute changes in climate and also soil type. Uh, I won't talk too much about the chemistry of limestone, although it certainly plays a role. For me, most important is its effects on soil structure, soil porosity, and importantly, drainage. Because, for example, in the Niagara Peninsula, there are parts with quite a lot of heavy clay weathered limestone essentially, but the fact that there are bits of stone mixed in with the soil allows water to drain and makes for a much happier, healthier environment for roots to flourish in. All right, so remember latitudes, lakes, and limestone, and you've got a good part of the Ontario wine story sussed out. Uh, this just a, a Quick slide to show you that it's not just about sedimentary effects of, of former inland seas, but also the effects of glaciers, which over several thousand years ground, churned up the overlying stone and created in many parts an almost powdery like layer of limestone or limestone sprinkled in the soil, creating that drainage, adding some porosity. You can see 14,000 years ago to the present day, as those glaciers receded, they ground up the surface a little differently in Niagara and uh, Lake Erie compared to Prince Edward County. Niagara, Lake Erie really churned up and turned the stone to dust, with the exception of the magnificent escarpment, which stands tall and proud. Whereas over in Prince Edward County, it was more of a scraping effect where a lot of the topsoil, what little soil there was, was literally scraped off and leaving today very, very shallow topsoil. There are some parts where there's barely more than a foot or two of dirt before you hit <clears throat> this fractured limestone underneath. So again, minor differences that make all the difference in the world for wine. All right, let's uh, break down the Appalachian system. First of all, first and foremost, I know you all know this, but it bears repeating one more time. VQA means 100% Ontario grown. That's not bottled in Canada. That is grown and bottled in Ontario in this case. Uh, I know you know all of this, but I guarantee you there are some customers who walk into the LCBO who are still a little confused by... Uh, the difference between a domestic international blend and what is really 100% Ontario grown VQA certified. Whenever you see that little uh, symbol on the bottle, the VQA stamp seal of approval, you know it's 100%. That's something we'd love you to pass on to consumers so that <clears throat> any remaining lingering confusion can be dispelled. All right, enough with that. Appalachian system, the VQA functions precisely like any other Appalachian system around the world. It is government run, which is to say it has the teeth to police the use of terms and the origin of grapes and all of the other things that go along with an Appalachian system, including the varieties that you can grow, the ripeness at harvest, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So at the bottom of the uh, classic pyramid is VQA Ontario. So these are for wines grown anywhere within one of the official viticultural areas or some of the emerging regions or from varieties that are perhaps not allowed under one of the Appalachians. So a step above VQ Ontario is VQA say Niagara Peninsula, Lake Erie North Shore, Prince Edward County. And above that, there are a couple of areas that have developed over time official sub-appellations. More on that in a moment. And at the, uh, the top, you could say, would be the name of a single vineyard within one of the official appellations or sub-appellations. And this would be, for the most part, what a winemaker has over time deemed to be a special site that's worth putting the name on the label that has some kind of unique characteristics. So 
and lots of stories behind each of those single vineyard wines. And just to cover off again the Appalachians, a little reminder, Lake Erie North Shore down in the southern part of uh, the province, Niagara and Niagara Peninsula, of course, around Niagara Falls, and over to the east of Toronto around Belleville, a little bit this side of Kingston is Prince Edward County. So those are the official viticultural areas under VQA regulations. As I mentioned, there are what are termed currently emerging regions. <clears throat> so these are areas that are not official designated viticultural areas yet, perhaps in time, they will gain that status, but for the time being, they fall under the VQA Ontario moniker. And that covers everything that's happening over, uh, over by Lake Huron up to um, Georgian Bay in the Collingwood area, uh, around Toronto, north of Toronto, Stouffville, down in Port Dover, and uh, now even more recently emerging area in the Ottawa Valley, a couple of wineries making some very, very exciting things over there. Now, I mentioned some of the sub-appellations. I'll let the winemakers delve a little bit more deeply into their particular sub-region of the Niagara Peninsula when we get there. But just to point out a couple of, of things here, if you think about the moderating effect of Lake Ontario and the important feature of the Niagara Escarpment, which is the significant topographic feature that runs right along here through these so-called bench appellations, all the way over to St. David's Bench and eventually down here to Niagara Falls. What happens between the lake and that escarpment system is really of prime importance. If we look at it, at it in terms of the uh, moderating effect, down by the shores of Lake Ontario, you get the greatest moderating effect, as you would imagine. That means cooler springs, because you're next to a cold body of water, it means slightly longer autumns, or a delay until the first frost, because now you're next to a warm body of water, warmed by the summer sun. <clears throat> Whereas up in the Vine Mount Ridge area or some of the upper bench Appalachians a little bit further from the lake. You warm up earlier in spring, but then again, fall comes a little bit earlier as well because you don't have that warm moderating effect of the lake. So it's all a game of distance from the lake. And I would say that in general, uh, some of the warmer areas would be down uh, just below the escarpment over here into the uh, Four Mile Creek, the Niagara on the Lake area, whereas the coolest parts would be up in the upper bench areas and certainly Vine Mount Ridge, all things being equal. Here is something that you can uh, take away uh, later on and read at home, just gives a little bit more detail about uh, each of the sub appellations, which by the way, I'll, I'll point out one more time, were created based on pure hard data, nothing anecdotal about it, created by Dr. Tony Shaw at Covey University based on uh, topographic features, soil features, distance from the lake, uh, climatic differences, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, I won't go too, mu too much further into this as I covered it before, but again, if we wanted to kind of break up the Niagara Peninsula into two main areas, the Niagara Escarpment region, which covers Short Hills 20 Mile and the Beamsville Bench would be one kind of general area. And I'll point out just for the sake of some numbers, growing degree days, so those are frost-free days above minus two, comes in about 1583, which is not cool. You know, this is considerably warmer than Champagne, than parts of Burgundy, than uh, certainly many parts of Germany. So we get the heat in the summertime to ripen a wide range of grapes from the early ripening varieties like Pinot Noir, right through to some of the later ripening grapes like Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah in some of the warmer parts of the uh, Niagara Peninsula in any case. And certainly slightly warmer is this Niagara on the lake area, and headlined by Four Mile Creek, the largest right in the middle, but surrounded by Niagara Lakeshore, Niagara River, and the St. David's Bench, which probably, and we'll check this fact in a moment, one of the warmest areas in the peninsula, which paradoxically you might find makes some pretty spectacular Pinot Noir. And then over into Prince Edward County, you can see the growing degree days drop quite precipitously. This is certainly a cool area. This is where you definitely want your short cycle varieties, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir being the two leading ones at the moment. And with that slightly uh, different type of limestone, you end up with these wonderfully edgy, stony mineral. We could even say wines more on that when we meet our winemakers from out that way. 
And then down in Lake Erie North Shore, today we don't have any Pinot Noir from Lake Erie to share with you, but it is a sunny place, the sunniest in Ontario and with the longest growing season. But the soil type is different here. It's a little bit less of a limestone story and more of a sandy uh, lake sedimentary soil profile, which in my uh, experience and having spoken to many winemakers down there tends to create wines of really fine finesse and perfume a little lighter structure perhaps for slightly earlier enjoyment and there is one sub appellation official in there called the South Islands which is essentially Pelee Island Canada's southernmost point a couple of quick facts about the variety itself it's only I say only 7% of the total VQA wine production by volume. It's not the most important red variety. It's not the most planted red variety, but it gets a disproportionate amount of the headlines. Why? Because who doesn't love Pinot Noir? It is one of the fine varieties of the world of wine. No one would dispute that. It really excels in cool climates, other places in the world, but certainly that is true in Ontario. So it has become over time one of our flagship varieties. And when I say R, I'm saying this because, you know, I feel part of this industry having grown up alongside it for so many years. And I would say one other thing about Pinot Noir, because Ontario got into it, I wouldn't say much later in the game, but the first Pinot wasn't planted in Ontario until the early 80s. It was uh, Carl Kaiser over on Five Rows, a Lowry uh, uh, property sometime in the early 80s planted the first Pinot Noir in Canada. So it doesn't have a very, very long history uh, compared to some other parts. But that also means that by the time most of the Pinot vineyards were planted in Ontario, there was the availability of really high quality vine material. I'm talking clonal material and specifically the so-called Dijon clones. So these are Burgundy clones that were selected uh, over many, many centuries, but didn't become commercially available internationally until the 80s, all right? So when all those plantings went in in the 90s and 2000s, it was with some of the top quality material so that Ontario pretty much had a head start, didn't start with uh, substandard Pinot Noir in terms of the plant material. So 1.3 million liters annually. And here's an interesting statistic that I did not know. This is straight from the mouth of Daniel Speck over at Henry Pelham, man I trust uh, intimately with facts and figures. And uh, he let us know that 20% of total sales of Pinot Noir. So all of the Pinot Noir from anywhere in the world sold at the LCBO, 20% represented by VQA Pinot Noir, local Pinot Noir. I thought that was a pretty extraordinary figure. Uh, and that just underscores how important Pinot Noir is, how well it does in Ontario, and how consumers are uh, now aware of that fact and buying into it. So there you have it. All right, Pinot Noir styles. Another thing that all of you know, no doubt, but uh, principally we're talking about dry table wines, classic Pinot Noir. But then again, we could get into a whole range of nuances, talking about whole bunch, stems or no stems, and then all of the myriad nuances that arise from that difference in distance from the lake, from those different soils, and of course, different techniques applied. So Pinot Noir comes in a pretty wide range of styles even in the dry table wine category but uh, increasingly producers are turning their their skills to sparkling wine traditional method sparkling wine some great blanc de blanc chardonnay based wines but also blanc de noir based on pinot noir and many blends thereof i think uh, ontario has a really spectacular climate for quality top quality sparkling wines in the traditional method and we're only going to see that category continue to grow and speaking of growing rosé i mean what a hot category that has been for the last couple of years pinot noir happens to make a particularly uh, appealing style of rosé in my opinion it's that shorter cycle variety so that you harvest it at full flavor ripeness yet still with beautiful acidity if you want to create that lighter more delicate fragrant style of rosé compared to something that would be a little bit meatier if you're using one of the Bordeaux varieties, which are more often than not made with saigné, so harvested to make red wine, but some juice bled off to make a little bit of rosé as a, as a byproduct, if you will. If you harvest the Bordeaux varieties at, uh, at an earlier period, you get a lot more of the green flavor, whereas rosé from Pinot Noir is pretty much ready to go on its own, not in the saigné style. So lots to discover, even within the relatively niche 
world of Pinot Noir from Ontario. Food and wine pairing, something that I spend a lot of time doing, I'm sure you do as well, eating and drinking every day, in fact. I do it. And Pinot Noir is uh, one of the sommeliers go-to wines for so many reasons, not just the number of styles that it's made of, made in rather, but even if we're talking about uh, table wine, Pinot Noir, well, because of its lower tannin structure and relatively higher acidity, it goes both ways, so to speak. You can go to fish, of course, we know about the beautiful pairings of Pinot Noir and salmon or meteor fish like halibut or even some lake trouts, through to the so-called white meats, pork and chicken, roasted, makes a particularly nice pairing, and then straight on into some of your dry aged uh, beefs. I love a great T-bone, at least 30 days, if not more, dry aging, so it develops a whole lot of umami flavor in the wine, and aged Pinot Noir, as we know, shifts into that wonderful spectrum of earth and mushrooms and forest floor and leaves and so on. And that pairing of umami and umami is just about as good as it gets. If we're going with rosé, something lighter, something fresher, obviously everything I just mentioned about fish and white meat still applies, or quiche. Why not? And then uh, the Blanc de Noir, the sparkling wine versions, as you all know, as we say in the sommelier world, when in doubt, go with sparkling and uh, why not sparkling based on Pinot Noir. Cheese, we make some pretty terrific cheeses here. Briefly, what does Pinot Noir go with, or rather, what does it not go with? Uh, I would pair it pretty much with everything other than, say, a really pungent, intense blue. Not too many wines can stand up to that. I would go sweet with that, I would go ice wine, but with uh, dry Pinot Noirs, take your pick. Some of these uh, goat-based cheeses, powder, Gouda, chevre, a little bit tangier, go with a, uh, a lighter style of, of Pinot Noir, maybe rosé Pinot Noir, higher acid, acid plus acid, works so well together. And for some of the uh, more structured wines, I would take it to a cheese that is also a little more structured, drier, tangier, like a uh, cheddar. An aged cheddar, two, three, four, five year cheddar would be a good pick with one of the more structured Pinot Noirs. All right, that's my brief little intro now. It's time to bring in the important folks, the ones who make it, the ones who have taken time out of their busy harvest schedule to be with us here today. And I'm going to bring in first Mauro Salvador, the winemaker at Vienna, Vieni Estates. Vieni, Vieni, come on, Mauro. Are you here with us today? Yes, I am. Hey, ciao. Come stai? Benissimo, John. Thank you very much. How are you doing? Fantastic. Come Io, io benone, io benone, grazie. All right, so um, we won't get into your beautiful range of grappas. I know you make some pretty terrific stuff up there. You're up in Vine Mount Ridge. First of all, tell us about the history of Vieni, what it means in Italian, and then the specifics of your 2017 Pinot Noir, please. Well, Vieni means come. So everyone is invited to come to our winery. Uh, Vieni has a history of 22 years on grape growing and only uh, close to 10 years on uh, winemaking. So before we were selling grapes uh, to other winery, we started making our own wine since uh, 2010. Really, really on our profit in 2012. So 2012 was our first uh, harvest year complete. And uh, 2012 was a phenomenal year for us. So when I start here in 2012 and we make our first Pinot Noir, I said, wow, this is a fantastic. And, I don't know, we won the, the Pinot Challenge, the, the double gold medal. And we said, wow, everything is coming good. Well, in 2013, really, it was not a phenomenal vintage for uh, the area. So since 2014, we start to manage different, mostly the Pinot Noir. The Pinot Noir is very important for us. We have a property with a 200 acre, and we have a 12 acre of Pinot Noir. So since 2014, we started to manage it more, a little bit different than the Pinot Noir. We give a little more attention. Uh, we reduce amount. So a Pinot Noir that is uh, no good as a zero value. So we give a lot, a lot of importance to that. So from 2014 to 17, we created our own recipe to do this wine. So very little amount of grape on the vine. And uh, the grape are selected with the optical sorting that we use with the vinyl together. So very, very well selected. The, every single berry has to be perfect. So after we have a, like a, a wonderful uh, automatic uh, tank uh, red fermenter and we have a 10 to 15 days skin contact. And after that, the wine is resting for over a year in barrel 
French barrel. 70% used, 30% new. And uh, we bottled the 17 last year. And uh, I'm kind of happy with this wine. This wine has a, a, a fruity flavor, an intense color, a nice intense color that sometimes for the Pinot Noir is a bit difficult. And uh, it's very typical because it's an earthy finish and uh, it's a little bit toasted. This is how the, the wine is uh, it tasting now. Vieni, uh, what you say, Vieni is also specialized in, uh, in sparkly. We don't do so much traditional, but we are more specialized in uh, Charmat. And uh, Pinot Noir is uh, so much... You know, Mauro, you can call it uh, the Italian method or the Martinotti, because we know <laughs> Monsieur Charmat just stole the headlines from the Italian who invented this project, right? Well, there's people that think differently, so I don't want to get into that discussion. So <laughs> the French say that the, the Italians told it to them, so I don't know who started really, but the point is, is working very well. The Prosecco is very famous for to everybody, but the, let's say uh, Ontario and all Ontario is growing also in the Charmat. And uh, the Pinot Noir is very flexible, like I said, and is working very well with Charmat as well. And you mentioned the, the Grappa. The Pinot Noir is a very well appreciated Grappa that we have here, actually. So it is good. And it's a very good use of the leftovers, really, of winemaking, right? Yes. Absolutely. You've got to do something with that pumice. Why not make it into a little grappa? Now yes, you mentioned uh, something really important. I mean, Pinot, Pinot is, is famous, famously an unforgiving grape, and uh, it's kind of an all or nothing proposition, right? It's almost impossible to make yes. great, inexpensive Pinot Noir. That means the yields have to be low in order to make something right. of character and, uh, and depth. Uh, how does that uh, factor play into your position up in Vine Mountain Ridge? Was I correct in saying that's maybe one of the more extreme areas that is short, hot summers, but yeah. uh, you know, fall comes yeah. pretty quickly there? Yes, it is. It is a little, we are uh, on top of this carmel. So we have an, an exposition uh, to the sun uh, that is uh, good, but we are 190 meters on the sea level. And uh, I definitely experienced the temperature that is lower than every other area. So I think we are definitely in the coolest area in the Niagara, Scare, in the Niagara Peninsula, for sure. And uh, we have like a three different block with three different ages. So we blend the grape uh, uh, on a different variety on the vines. So that is also make a nice difference. And uh, the night uh, and the day can be at least one degree lower respect to the, the, the other parts in Niagara Peninsula, that for sure. And uh, the spring, you mentioned it before, is a, a little warmer, earlier. So I, incredible, some, someday I'm experiencing like five, six degrees higher than the area close to the lake. But definitely the winter is coming earlier. And uh, we have the first frost here. And uh, it's difficult to go ahead with mature and ripening the, the other variety. But the Pinot Noir, because it's an early ripening variety, is working very well here. So I'm uh, very happy about that. And uh, because with the background is also Italian, and uh, we also work with the Appassimento, so we kind of do something similar also for the Pinot Noir. We don't harvest the Pinot Noir, we do Appassimento with the Pinot Noir, but we leave the, the grape and the vine as longer as we can, so to take the best from the season. And uh, on the best season, the grape is salty. And uh, when we're going to harvest, uh, a few, like a percentage of the berry, a percentage of the bunches, they are definitely a little bit dried. So for this reason, we obtain like a Pinot Noir that is a higher in alcohol and a little bit more structure than a, a regular Pinot Noir. And that, that's true of this uh, 2017? Yes. I'm just looking at the, the alcohol, it's stated as 14% on the label, which is unusual for Ontario, unusual for Pinot Noir, but that's due to that slightly late harvest. So if I'm a consumer looking for Pinot Noir, but I want something a little bit richer, a little bit more full-bodied, Vieni. Correct, correct. We harvest that uh, the 17th, uh, October the, the 4th, on the 17th, and we try to get everything from the season. So it's always, always, when we have to harvest, then we're going to harvest the Pinot Noir. Well, I wish you uh, all the best for this season. I hope you can get the maximum out of 2020. We all deserve only the best this year, I think. <laughs> we, are, we are trying for the, another double gold medal with the 2020 Pinot Noir. Double gold medal. Well, 
we we are trying. So I will not say nothing. Right. But I was missed putting up your slide there. But there are the details. The LCB already knows this because it's regularly on their shelves. But Mauro, thank you uh, so much. Thank you, John. Uh, we'll let you get back to the crush pad then. Grazie. Thank you. Buona giornata. Okay. Ciao. 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 All right. So let's move from uh, Vine Mount Ridge well over into the other part of the province to Prince Edward County. And let's bring in Monsieur Frédéric Picard, who comes from a place that knows a fair bit about uh, Pinot Noir. Fred, are you with us? Yeah, I think so. Hi, John. How are you? Welcome, welcome. Are you in the middle of harvest as well? No, uh, we are a little bit later than Niagara here. So on my side, we starting uh, Saturday. So a couple of days more of rest and then uh, before the big rush. Well, that means you're probably um, hosing down the winery, getting it ready, cleaning it up for all of the grapes that are about to come in. That's exactly what I'm doing. Cleaning, <laughs> cleaning, cleaning. All Be right, ready. so tell us a little bit uh, about Tough Estates, about Lanny. I know he was, he's a PEC native and was uh, among the, the pioneers of, of the county starting uh, oh, 20 years or so ago now. Tell us about, uh, about the estate and your history with Huff. Yeah, well, uh, Lanny uh, is a native from Prince Rock County, as you said. I came on board in 2003 um, from France after a harvest in uh, Niagara. And uh, yeah, so he started a winery in the uh, middle of nowhere, if I can say it at the time. Uh, we knew we could go grapes, but we knew it was also a big challenge. And uh, we have now uh, almost 20 years of a slowly experience. Uh, but uh, I think knowing that now Prince Edward County has so many wineries, we know that the quality of, of the wine is here. We have uh, about 32 acres uh, divided in two different vineyards. One is, one is at the winery and with probably more uh, clay and limestone soil. And the other one is in uh, southeast of the island. Uh, I'm gonna call that the island if I may. Mm -hmm. And we are more in a, in a clay soil, a little bit of alluvion. Uh, it's, it's a part of the vineyard that was very close to the water. So uh, a slightly this different is, This type is of soil. South, South Bay area you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, exactly, the South Bay area. Uh, so that's why we have a line of wine that we call South Bay Vineyard, because it's uh, only from that vineyard. So um, we, we're not a big winery. I think the county has mostly small wineries here. We, we're around seven southern cases uh, every year. Uh, like I say, we have those two vineyards, and in terms of grapes, we're growing uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Gris for white, uh, Pinot Noir, Merlot, and Cabernet Franc from red, for red. So um, that's about what we do here. Uh, we did uh, starting a sparkling project, one of the first uh, here in 2003 with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, uh, and I think we try to develop that, as uh, you mentioned before, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, are the main grapes here. I will say nowadays Pinot Gris is coming strongly as well. Um, and yeah, so that's where we are here. Now, uh, now when you planted Pinot Noir initially, was it with the idea to make sparkling wine or did you always have a plan to make uh, dry table wine from it as well? Well, I, um, when we planted Pinot Noir, it was mainly for sparkling uh, because I like the, I, as we know, we had a very short growing season here, it's a bit colder than Niagara, and I knew that sparkling will do well. We have a beautiful soil and um, the acidity is uh, quite, quite pronounced and, and very delicate and nice. So that's something I wanted to know. And since the Pinot Noir developed here, we slowly decided to plant a bit more to go on the red wine um, uh, uh, production. But I would say that our main focus was sparkling since the beginning. Mm. So um, just to talk about the wine uh, a little bit. So the, um, the 2017 was actually uh, an interesting vintage for me because it's really the first red wine that I make in terms of uh, a bigger production. And uh, 2017 was a very interesting year uh, after a, a very difficult uh, spring or very wet. It was even very difficult to go in, in the vineyard for many weeks. Uh, we ended up to have a kind of a nice summer with the right amount of rain and a beautiful fall. And the beautiful fall allowed us to, uh, to gain back the sugar we wanted uh, to wait the fruit to grow and get uh, the final ripeness. And uh, I remember that it was really one of the first vintage or you could take your time, pick up whatever you wanted. 
uh, anyway, so that's for me uh, one of the best vintage, definitively. Um, and also, uh, don't know if it's related to the drought that we have in 2016, but this is the first year or we end up to get more than three tons an acre. And for the county, it's uh, it's an amazing thing. So um, wow, that's really yeah, that's an impressive rest. impressive harvest. That's <laughs> that's a big number yeah. for the county. <laughs> so um, the one itself, what to say? Um, it was uh, fermented and maceration and aged in a big oak vat, uh, about four thousand liters. And uh, there was a couple of barrel on the side, new barrel. So it's only a 10% wine age in, 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 in new oak, sorry, 10% new oak. Uh, like I said, it was an interesting year. So what I decided that it's uh, to go a little bit more extraction. Uh, the, the, the maceration time was not especially longer than usual, but I tried to extract a little bit more, a little bit more pigeage. And then uh, I think you can find in the wine that the tannins were a little bit uh, uh, too young and too firm at the beginning. Uh, I find them actually much more integrated now, so I'm happy that uh, people can enjoy it. Uh, but it's a wine who's still a bit closed for, for a while. Um, in terms of uh, aromas and flavor, I think it's I think it's typical county Pinot Noir. We're very focused on fruit, very red berries, blackberries, uh, uh, black fruit like plum. Uh, but for me, the, the, the interesting part of that wine is the try to allow to a little bit more extraction to make it age a bit longer in the time. Mm -hmm. It's even come around since I first tasted this uh, 2017. You know, the tannins have softened up and they're, they're really quite beautiful at the moment. And uh, yeah, I agree with you. 2017 didn't look like it was going to be much from the start, but turned out to be, at least so far, uh, for me, one of the best vintages so far in Ontario for Pinot Noir. You know, a little adversity maybe up front was what helped build a little character in the wine on the back end. And for, for County Pinot, I'd say this is yeah quite structured, quite rich, certainly ageable for another three, four or five years. Who knows? We'll have to see where it goes from here. Although right now with, uh, with the right piece of uh, protein on the table, off the grill, it would be absolutely delightful. Do you have any favorite pairings with, uh, with your Pinot? What, do, what would you, you and your wife are at home, you're pulling out a bottle of this to check in on it. What's for well, dinner? you know, I, I I like with white meat, like you, you were mentioning before, and ripe cheese. But I've got a. I also like it with duck. We find uh, duck. Why not? It's not too too gamey, but it's a it's a very interesting uh, uh, pairing with that pinot on on that side. Uh, but definitely, uh, I really like my pinot my cheese as well. So ripe ripe cheese and strong cheese with a lot of flavor in it. Well, you come by it honestly. You are from France, after all. So. Yeah. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> bon, well, uh, thank you uh, so much for sharing uh, your story from out in Prince Edward County. We'll let you get back to the winery to prepare for harvest that's uh, coming on uh, shortly. But merci infiniment and uh, see you very soon, I hope. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Allez, au revoir. Au revoir. Right. From Monsieur Frederic Picard, let us pop back to the Niagara Peninsula and spring in one of uh, Ontario's most experienced winemakers, Mr. David Shepard. David, are you with us? There, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, yes. We can hear you. Very yes. good. Thank you for having me. Can we, uh, can we get a, a video up? Can you see yourself there? There we are. All right. Welcome, Dave. Not yet. How oh, are you? Yep. Okay, okay, so uh, I know you've made wine all across the uh, the peninsula, worked with Pinot Noir for many years from many different spots. So you are the ideal man to speak to, to get a sense of, of how Pinot works in a more general sense, and then tell us uh, the background details. We did meet uh, Ed in the session on Chardonnay, so he gave us a little bit of background on Flat Rock Cellars, but uh, please fill in the blanks for us if you would, and then tell us the specifics about the Gravity Pinot. All right. Well, um, one of the things that actually brought me to Flat Rock Cellars was that, uh, you know, I'm more than just a winemaker, I'm a wine drinker, a wine fan. And like my colleagues that you're talking to today, we all have our favorites. We like to horse trade around for, for the wines we love. Uh, and I've always been a fan of Flat Rock Cellars, um, in particular the Pinot. Uh, when I was working for years with, with my dear friend and mentor, Carl Kaiser. We did lots of Pinot Noir and, and I was lucky to be part of a, a group of uh, wineries who came along a bit later and did all kinds of experimentation with Pinot. Um, in the beginning, nobody thought it was, 
it was going to grow very viably. Everybody was a bit worried about it being so sensitive and so on. But uh, we've reached a point now where this industry is really uh, focused on it, I think, and focused in a smart way. Uh, I think you'll find Pinot Noir doesn't grow everywhere in Ontario. Not every producer is doing it. Uh, but the people that have the right location are doing it and doing it very well. And I think that's where Flat Rock fits in. So I was very happy to come here. I think this is a great uh, spot in particular for Pinot. And we've got over 30 acres of it that I think is uh, proving that right. That's a, that's a pretty uh, big bet on, uh, on the variety. So obviously you, you believe in it. Now, not to get off topic here, but you do have uh, some, some vintage history. Have you noticed that uh, the changing climate has favored Pinot Noir or favored perhaps uh, Ontario in general? Or is it just proving to be uh, a, a headache like it is in so many other parts of the world? Well, I, I think there are aspects of our climate that will always give us uh, headaches. And you can probably see by the, the color of my harvest beard that uh, there's, <laughs> there's worries in any given year. Uh, but I think over the years, we've kind of mitigated all that by uh, site selection. And, um, you know, there will always be challenges. And I think that's part of, part of the fun of making Pinot. And to be honest, I think Pinot the way it grows, it, it likes a bit of a challenge because uh, it produces, I think, some of the, the more interesting wines in years that uh, outside do not look too easy. Uh, Right. Well, I mean, uh, we understand the gravity part. We saw the, the uh, visual of the cellar itself. They're built on the escarpment, so everything is flowing by gravity, a, a beautiful way to run things. But I'm always struck um, tasting this wine now for several vintages about the depth, the concentration, and the ripeness that you're able to achieve. You're right up there in the 20-mile bench, so a good distance from the lake. I wouldn't call it a very cool site, but certainly not a very hot site. What's the secret here? Is it just a question of uh, careful farming and low yields? Well, I think we're in, in kind of a cool spot here in that um, as cool the escarpment. Cool in uh, like a fun spot, not literally cool. A fun spot, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, I, at this part of the escarpment is, is kind of a two-stage two uh, uh, rise, and we're kind of hanging on the second part of that rise, but not on the top. So our Pinot Noir vineyards actually have a beautiful slope, and because of the way the, the escarpment undulates, uh, we've got a lot of different orientations. So we've got uh, many different blocks. I would typically um, harvest 10 to 15 different lots of Pinot Noir, depending on how the part of the vineyard uh, is ripening. And it makes for, I think, wines with a lot of uh, variation within that variety. It gives me lots to play with. So when we're putting something together like the, the gravity, uh, I've got a lot of ingredients to play with. I can source all these little lots that, of Pinot Noir that were fermented separately from our, our um, estate vineyards here, and then do barrel tastings and things to kind of pull together those individual lots that have the character that we're looking for in gravity. And that is the, the layers of flavors and the texture and the structure. Yeah, that was my next question. I know you make a couple of different Pinots. What are the, what are the lots that make that cut? Do you already know what those are in the vineyard or is it more of a, a barrel selection or cellar selection? Uh, every year I kind of fool myself into thinking I know where it's going to come from in the vineyard because you see how the different blocks develop. Uh, but in the end, we'll actually sit down uh, myself and my assistant, Allison and Ed, the owner, and we'll do about a six or seven hour marathon tasting, uh, totally blind of every barrel of Pinot Noir that we have in the building. And we, we try to do it totally blind with no, no bias as to the cooper or the age of the barrel, any of that kind of stuff or where it came from. And we try to put together purely by flavor profile what we want for gravity. So it does oftentimes uh, end up to be more of this block than that block but there's no formula to it. It's, it's purely an exercise in um, so it's putting an exercise flavor in, profile together. In flavor profile. So how would you describe your Pinot Noir to someone who walks in uh, off, the, off the street for the concession and says, okay, what's the difference between these Pinots, your two Pinots, and then from other parts of the peninsula? How do you describe in, in your terms this, the flavor profile? 
All right, and I would say in, in my terms for, for gravity, we always, and 17 is probably a very good example of this, have ones that have a very, very pronounced Pinot character. As soon as you put it in the glass and you take a whiff, it kind of jumps out at you and says, I am Pinot Noir, give me a taste. Uh, that's one thing I love about it. Um, I think it's a, it's a wine that we, um, as we select it, we're looking for blocks that maybe are showing a little bit more acidity than some of the others and a little bit more uh, tannin emphasis. So we're really trying to craft uh, something that's got longevity and uh, a bit more of an interesting texture to it. Um, what's what's it's your not uh, going to be ideal drinking window for this 2017? Are you drinking this now? Or are you going to tuck a few cases in the cellar for 2021, 22, or beyond? Uh, we are just beginning to drink it now. Uh, we've had it tucked away. Typically, the gravity we try to hold back uh, for a year or two longer than the other Pinot Noirs that we make um, for the reason that it's, it's crafted for longevity. And because of that, it also often needs a bit more time before it's drinking. Uh, but I think the 17 is just coming on now. Um, if I had the patience, I'd probably wait another year, but I personally don't have that patience. I struggle with that. Um, I enjoy it too much. So I'm, I'm starting to drink it myself right now. And I think in the last probably four to five months, it's really turned the, the corner and opened up it's a bit more expressive now than it was earlier. Yeah, I have to say, I've got it in my glass now. It's uh, showing beautiful perfume, pretty classic Pinot, as you say. Lots of lovely fruit. And for me, it's really more about the texture. You know, when you've got suppleness and freshness at the same time, you've really hit, hit the uh, nail on the head for Pinot. So, Dave Shepard, thank you uh, so much for joining. I can see you're in the winery there. I know you've got to get back to, uh, to work. So, uh, thanks for joining us here. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, so long. All right, let's uh, head back on out to uh, the county. Let's bring back Mr. Keith Tyres. We met him in the Chardonnay session. Keith, are you with us? Uh, there you are. All right, so you're, you're really out there. I mean, you're sitting in the Watson Vineyard in Niagara at the moment, getting ready to do some harvesting. So we won't take too much of your time. You gave us a little bit of the background uh, of Klaus and Chase back in that Chardonnay session, but uh, let's switch over to Pinot. Give us your impression of Pinot from the county, your style, what you're seeking to achieve. Sure, of course. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so Pinot Noir from the county is, I, 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 the Pinot Noir, uh, the vine is just at home in Prince Edward County and more specifically on uh, at Clawson Chase uh, on our two slopes in both the South Clow and in the um, and in the uh, church uh, side. in the church side couldn't think of it there all of a sudden holy lord uh, so it, it just seems to be a great place both climactically and soil composition um, along with kind of just the whole terroir aspect of of site selection soil composition, exposure to the sun, and the right clonal selections on the right rootstock. Um, and I, I'd like to think that we've been producing uh, really good Pinot Noirs of great characteristic uh, of wines that aren't high in alcohol, which is, I think, is huge for the county. Um, really ripe Pinot in the county is 12 and percent, which 17 is because of uh, that beautiful September that we had. Uh, other than that, um, it, as you've mentioned several times and everybody else has mentioned, 17 was not trending to be a great year um, to the point that uh, I thought I'd have to thin again and drop yields from, from 1.6, 1.7 tons down to 1.2 to get them right. Um, but uh, as climate has affected us all, uh, that year in September, it showed us a, a great thing and, and gave us, you know, 23, 26 degree weather, uh, lots of sunshine, uh, fairly cool nights in that 13 to 15 degree range. Um, and just allowed the fruit to develop and ripen to what's in your glass now. And the, uh, the vineyard Pinot Noir is a, is a barrel blend. It's a selection of both the church side and the South Clo, predominantly the church side, um, just because that's where there's more vines planted. Um, so it generally tends to be roughly, you know, anywhere between 80 to 90% church side uh, with the remaining balance being South Clo, depending upon the vintage and the yields. Um, it's, uh, it's, Distemmed, it's not crushed. Uh, for me, it's about handling the fruit less. So we do all our we do all our our sorting in the vineyard so that only the best fruit gets out of the vineyard to make it to the crush pad. 
uh, distem it gently, uh, do it in large, uh, large fermenta fermenters like um, Fred does, like I think a lot of us do. Uh, we use wood, um, hopefully looking to explore some concrete and stainless steel down the road. But right now, uh, we're staying with the more traditional method, um, doing some cold soak on it and then letting it come naturally to itself. Uh, something that I do that I, I think is maybe slightly different is as, as Pinot finishes out, uh, we rack the free run separate from the press juice. So I, I find as a winemaker that allows me the ability to, to blend back tannic, tannin and structure and all the other fun things that we do uh, with Pinot to cry and create that elusive, um, hmm. elusive gem that we're all trying to hunt down. As somebody <laughs> said to me, it's, it's the carrot that you can never catch, right? Um, we're all trying to strive to make that great Pinot Noir that made us Pinot Noir fans in the past. So, um, and, and to be clear, that's that's twelve point five percent natural alcohol. This is with yes, any chapitalization. No, chap I, no, I don't chapitalize the Pinots. Um, and I think it's uh, I think it's I think the county is great at delivering fresh fruit um, of the red varietal. Not generally often do we get into the black, although I think you sometimes see some some spicy plum nuances in our wines. Um, but they still have that great acidity. Um, and the minerality in the county for me is more of that beetroot kind of dusty, dirty nuance than it is maybe some of the green hay that we sometimes see in, in Niagara Pinots. Um, mm, but again, a, a, good way, a good way to describe it. Yeah, for me, very, very beetroot like. There's an earthy component. Uh, yeah. Maybe not quite dirty, but, uh, but certainly <laughs> brings out all of that beautiful, savory character of Pinot Noir. I think that's absolutely think, great. Grape so great and so excruciatingly low yields even for you know your let's call it the entry level Pinot Noir because you make a, a couple of the single vineyards correct and then the Grand Cuvée now as as of 2017 so it's amazing that you can do what you do for the price that you uh, do it at so uh, kudos for thank you thank you for waving and the flag for the for the county we're trying we're doing our best and uh, you know the, the great thing about Pinot Noir in general is that it's really has a lot of diversity when it comes to food. Um, and, and I also say moments in the day um, because you can have a Pinot uh, at a table and, and provide everything to everybody with it. Somebody who's having a, a, a nice delicate piece of red meat can have Pinot. Somebody who's eating vegetarian can have Pinot. Um, and somebody who just wants to have a glass of wine can have a Pinot. So it, it offers itself in many different, uh, many different fashions. And uh, as we all, maybe start to eat more meatless. I find that Pinot has a great affinity with, uh, with mushrooms uh, and risotto um, so that you all of a sudden have some texture, some richness and some depth of flavor there to, to match up to all those beautiful characteristics that Pinot uh, offered. That's a, that's a terrific point. I know it's a, a favorite of, uh, of, of the vegan world and I have to speculate that's because it has its own kind of savory meatiness that you get without actually having meat. It's got its own so. umami. Thanks for thanks for bringing that point in. That's terrific. We'll let you get back to your uh, to your. Thank video. you guys. Hi, we seen there. Thank you so much, uh, Keith, and we shall see you again soon. Sounds great. Thank you. Cheers. You too. All right, there are the details on that. But of course, you knew them already. Let's um, head back over to Niagara. We're going to bring in Mr. Rob Powers, who, when he saw my title, principal critic, he thought we were going to be arguing philosophy, but no, we're going to keep it to uh, Pinot Noir. <laughs> Rob, are you there? I am. Can you see me? We're waiting for you to appear on the screen, and there you are. All right. So there we are. Welcome. I know you. Thank uh, you, John. How are you? I'm, I'm having a terrific day, but then again, I'm not in the middle of harvest, and I know you are. So <laughs> why don't you tell us uh, you know, a little bit about Queenston Mile? We know you also work over at Creekside. I'm also interested in hearing about the St. David's Bench in particular, because I know you've spent a lot of time, worked with a few varieties out there. How is the St. David's area special for uh, Pinot Noir, or different, shall we say? Well, John, you mentioned earlier in the presentation about distance from the lake, right? And so where we are on the St. David's bench, we're about nine kilometers from the Lake Ontario shoreline. So that, that means we are about as far away from any kind of moderating influence as, as Niagara Peninsula viticulture gets. That's a bit of a double-edged sword in that um, in the winter, if we get the dreaded polar vortex, then we're going to be, we, we have no protection whatsoever. And it's, it's one of the coldest sites in the dead of winter. But in the summer and uh, especially in the spring for fast starts and then in the fall 
uh, that site is one of the warmest in Niagara, which I think is why um, the Queenston Mile Vineyard has a reputation for being able to ripen um, Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah varieties about as well as anywhere else on the peninsula. Uh, to bring that back to Pinot then, though, it's, it's almost too warm for Pinot. I don't think it's too warm for Pinot Noir because we're able to make some wonderful wines out of there, but the, the late season heat means that the fruit um, comes off, not necessarily super sugar ripe relative to the rest of the peninsula, but very phenolically ripe, quite concentrated. And um, basically I have to be very careful not to over extract the wine because it can become very tannic in a big hurry. Mm -hmm. There are uh, two clones of Pinot on that vineyard. Um, 115, which is, it brings a lot of structure to the blend and 667, which is more about mouthfeel. So if, if you could, uh, put that in Bordeaux terms. 115 is the Cabernet Sauvignon that lends lends backbone to 667's flesh, if you will, if that makes some sense. Yeah, that's the first time I've ever heard Pinot compared to Bordeaux, but uh, that's... Yeah. Well, that's what, that's what you get when a guy from a guy that works with both varieties all the time. <laughs> now, um, so we're tasting this this proud poor uh, Pinot for B, so you're going to tell us about the uh, the B part of the story, but I just wanted to point out the, uh, the color, uh, which is a little paler then usually it looks like it's going to be a, a lighter wine, but then you put it in your mouth. And as you say, there's quite a lot of, uh, of richness and density. Is that um, kind of garnet color typical for Queenston Mile Vineyard? Uh, no, it, it was a bit more exaggerated in the, in 2018. It's funny that you should, uh, that when you were talking to the last winemaker, we were talking about savory and beetroot and texture. And that's really what that wine is all about. That's what that vineyard gives us. It's, um, really more of a, a mouthfeel thing rather than a fruit experience. A little I, I, bit of I agree 100, in there. 100%. We tasted this at Wine Align um, just a couple of days ago. And uh, my notes are all about potpourri and savoriness and then put it in my mouth and wow, the, the texture was, I would say, unexpected, but it was just amazingly silky. I mean, very, very phenolically ripe. Those tannins were very powdery and dusty and so light and, and fine grain. And, yeah, uh, that's, that's the vineyard and I have to be really careful to manage that or it'll turn into a big tan dark tannic monster. Um, I know you wanted to talk about the proud pour part of things. So there is the bottle. Let's see if we can get it some kind of focus. Don't have to look at it too much. The point is that the label yells, proud poor Pinot for bees. What does that mean? Uh, our owner and president, a man named Andrew Howard, is actually an amateur apiarist, a beekeeper, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, he was, uh, you know, trolling around the internet and he found this proud poor Pinot for bees in the United States. Uh, if anybody that's interested should hit proudpour.com. Proudpour is, is an environmental uh, charity and 5% of top line revenue from the sale of these wines uh, gets allocated out to specific um, environmental organizations. In the case of Proudpour Pinot for Bees, it's a, uh, if you hit xerces.org on the net, uh, it's an organization that plants a lot of wild, wildflowers and is very involved in trying to keep neonicotinoids uh, sprays out of the environment when at times when the bees are flying. So very worthy cause. Um, what I love about it, you know, I'm not a born cynic, but I am a cautious man. So many charities uh, are all about net proceeds. This is 5% of top line revenue. So 5% of your 22.95 goes directly to the charity. Well, that, uh, that's huge. Yeah, I noticed you make yeah. that, that clear distinction between profit and top line revenue. And as we know, in the wine business, margins are tight as they are. So that's yeah. a real commitment to the environment. So uh, congratulations for, for you for doing that. You can drink local, support local, but also do good for the environment. So it's a, yeah. it's a triple win. And just about the winemaking, you know, this is a Queenston Mile bottling. In 2018, because our barrel program at Queenston Mile for Pinot is still on the newish side, we have probably more new wood, um, more newer wood, if you will, than I would prefer to put in the cuvee. Uh, so when we were doing the blending for 2018, there were two cuvées that presented themselves, one with a bit more new wood, 
that we put in under this label. And then the Queenston Mile Cuvee has, has mostly older wood. So that was the way we delineated it. But both of them are single vineyard wines, both 115 and 667. Well, I have to say it's not showing a lot of wood, this wine, although uh, I do love that savory character. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Proud pour, pour proudly, save the bees, drink good wine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Oh, Back cheers, to harvest John. it is. Back to harvest. See you. All right. See you soon. Bye-bye. All right. So let's head from the Queenston Mile area to the other end of the Peninsula, the very first winery, I guess you'd be uh, hitting if you're coming from Toronto. And let's bring in Ilya Senchuk. How are you, Ilya? Hey, good. How are you doing, John? I am terrific. And again, I know you are also in the middle of harvest, so we'll cut right to the chase here. Uh, for those who don't know, Leaning Post Wines, when did you first plant that, that first Leaning Post? Uh, a little bit of your history. And then I know this is a blend from the region we were just in, plus your home vineyard. So give us a little bit about your take on the differences you see across the peninsula. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, great to be here. Um, yeah, so my history, I mean, I was a winemaker in um, Niagara for about 10 years uh, before my wife Nadia and I started Leaning Post. Um, but I've always been really fascinated with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, um, uh, especially in Niagara. So I kind of um, grew up in the area as a winemaker in terms of learning all about it. Um, so when uh, we decided to uh, start our own uh, winery, we were really looking for places that were, that I thought would really uh, be uh, the best areas for those two grape varieties and for cooler grape varieties generally. Um, so we found a beautiful property uh, in 2011 uh, in uh, what is uh, Lincoln Lakeshore sub-Appalachian, but more specifically, it's in a little town called Winona. So um, on kind of the um, extreme end, uh, the, the, you know, the beginning or the end of Niagara, depending on how you look at it. And I always like to say it's the beginning. Um, <laughs> But most importantly, um, you can see on the map and the geography in the way that uh, it's sort of the very opposite of the area we were just talking about in St. David's, um, where we are the entire distance from the lake to the escarpment is 1.5 kilometers. So it's really heavily, heavily lake influenced. And I do think that that uh, generally is something that I'm really excited about because that keeps uh, our growing season in the middle of it. Um, always moderated and cool. So although the length of our season is pretty similar to a lot of parts of Niagara, um, I, I do notice that, you know, our, our spring is definitely slower um, and our, uh, our heat spikes are not as extreme. And then our, uh, our uh, fall is sort of very moderated with cooler nights showing up quite a bit earlier in the season. So all of those things together really, I think, uh, make for the kind of Pinot Noirs that I, that I personally really love. Um, so uh, I in know terms that, of this, that home vineyard is, is, is coming along and you've got a couple of vintages under your belt, but this particular one is a blend of, of the home vineyard and also the Lowry vineyard, if I'm not mistaken, over in St. Correct. Yeah. 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 So this is um, essentially what we do with this one. I'll show the little uh, bottle shot there. Um, but um, what we do with this wine is generally what we will do is uh, putting our wines together. We will, uh, put uh, kind of this wine together as we're putting our single vineyard wines together. So we'll be uh, putting together what we think is the best versions of the terroir from something like Lowry, our vineyard. Uh, we have actually added three or four vineyards to our staple in the meantime. And then um, we will also try and put together um, kind of a more regional blend, which is what this wine is. Um, and But really, again, we're, what we're trying to do here is always put together a wine that I feel is very harmonious and shows uh, what uh, I think Niagara Pinot is all about. Um, and in particular, uh, me as a winemaker, I think in maybe contrast to some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, uh, wines you might have tasted from Niagara, I mean, generally all of my Pinots are all about finesse. I mean, I'm really looking for uh, the balance, uh, really good acidity. Particularly, I like, I like to kind of show this wine because 2016 was a very hot and dry uh, vintage. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you taste this wine, I don't think that comes out in the wine at all. I think I'm very, uh, very picky on, on, on uh, the, on my picking times and on just keeping uh, that sort of acidity, that earthy freshness in the wine, but also sort of a good balance and extract so that when uh, all those kind of pieces work together, we end up with a wine that is really silky, beautiful, um, earthy and fruity now, but then we'll definitely uh, age if you want it to. So, and I sp particularly this wine, because it has um, a, just the beginnings of age on it, I think it's really, really in a beautiful spot right now to drink. 
Yeah, I have to say, uh, again, I, I'm more of a texture than an, than an aroma man. And uh, this is really fine, silky. You know, it has a little bit of that, uh, that, that fresh raw silk character that we saw in uh, Rob's wine before, the Proud Pour. But you've really done a, a magnificent job getting that ripeness in without going over 12.5% alcohol, but fully ripe phenolics and beautiful perfume. So thank you. I've been, uh, now it makes me want to come and taste uh, all the single vineyards with you. But I know you're in the middle of harvest, so we'll, <laughs> we'll let you go. Thanks Perfect. so much, uh, Ilya. We'll all right, thanks very soon. much, John. We'll, uh, th thanks for doing this. Thank you. And that, uh, that wraps up our little tasting. We're going to turn it back over to Magdalena Kaiser, who's got a few words to uh, finish off the session. Thank you, John. Uh, would you mind moving to the next slide? That's perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so thank you again to everyone. Thank you to John for this uh, great session and uh, to all of the producers today. Uh, and as we all know, um, harvest is a busy time, but it's also a passionate, fun time. So uh, the stories from everyone today have been really um, lots of fun to listen to. And uh, we also always want to thank the LCBO staff uh, for uh, being part of these sessions and watching and being committed to education and knowledge uh, to provide superior ser service um, at your stores. Uh, with that, uh, again, here I am reminding everyone that VQA equals certified 100% Ontario grown. And that really is the most sustainable choice for people living in Ontario. And um, that's, you know, more and more important every single day and uh, during this time of harvest, it's certainly something to continue to remember. Uh, it's important for jobs in Ontario and our overall economic, uh, our economy essentially. Every single bottle contributes $98.20 back to our economy. And, um, and, and lastly, um, you know, especially in this session around Pinot Noir, uh, really the value proposition is, is so important to understand. Uh, our wines are uh, on the global stage and visitors uh, that I get to tour around, uh, not so much lately, but uh, over the years, uh, really talking about how great Ontario Pinot Noir is. And um, we're just very fortunate to be living here and being able to, to have these wonderful wines. So just as a reminder, uh, with the last slide, if anybody has any questions on the actual wines today, the producers or any of us, please do send um, Doug Beatty a message. He's the Ontario BQA Wine Ambassador and he's always there to help answer questions. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next session. Have a great day.